This morning we'd like to make uh, Pastor Josh has some really good news on the numbers. As I, I do. You all are probably wondering. So the unofficial attendance from this the 60th annual turkey barbecue was 3,406 people. So it was a great turnout. It was a great event, and it was great to be in the community for that. Uh, a couple other things I just wanted, since I have so many of you in one spot, we have Vacation Bible School coming up here at the church, which is open to everybody, uh, all the kids uh, in the community, uh, whether you're Lutheran or not Lutheran, it does not matter. So if you are interested in that, uh, either connect with me or Joan Huso, and we will get you signed up. It is June 30th through July 2nd, right? Yes, I got that right. I remembered something this morning. Good. Um, my uh, special thanks to um, all of you for coming and being a part of this. Um, we are live on Facebook, so a special welcome to all of those joining us uh, from outside of this community. Um, my thanks to those that are participating in worship this morning as well. Um, are there other announcements that I'm forgetting? Yeah, well, one thing, church camps are going on this uh, season now, so we have um, Pahocha Bible Camp, Cooperstown Bible Camp, Red Willow, uh, Park River, Park River as well. So if kids have an opportunity or if you have the ability to support kids that haven't gone or willing to help pay to support them, I know uh, the United Community Church, any kid that comes to us that wants to go to camp, we are more than willing to use our funds to pay for them to go to camp so that they have a good experience uh, deepening their faith in Christ as well as having an opportunity to know Christ. So it's a good thing. Christian camps are a great experience. My wife and I, Darcy, we actually met at Camp Joy Bible Camp on Star Lake in Kent, Minnesota, which is a great ministry there. And it's just a good opportunity for a person. I don't know anybody that will get to the end of their life and say, man, I really wish I never went to Bible Camp. It's, just, it's true. It's something that isn't going to happen. So make sure you afford everyone, even neighbor kids, that maybe don't go to church. They'll have a great experience, a great fun time. So. All right, with that, I invite you to stand as we begin our worship with, there is a... We have also an announcement for shirts. Oh, hand. that's right, I forgot. Mandy will be, well, you can still stand, but Mandy will be in the back. There is still some memorabilia le uh, left uh, to be sold, so please connect with her out there if you want something uh, to commemorate uh, this weekend. Now, let's sing. Yeah. 
wonderful blessing that we get to sing hymns out loud together. That's our one opportunity in our lifetime where we get to proclaim God's truth, the truth that we know out loud together. We have a blessing now to have special music by Mandy. Her mom, uh, Patty, will be playing accompaniment for her. And uh, what a blessing it is. You ready, Mallard? Please come up and sing. Thank you, Mallory. Let's hear a passage from God's Word. Colossians, the second chapter, starting in the sixth verse. As you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving.
darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful man, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh. 
At this time, we will receive our, our offering. Uh, the offering will go uh, to the care center in town as it is custom and tradition that we do. So at this time, I invite the ushers forward. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered into feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, now if we could have the children come forward for the children's service. The children's message. I know there are some kids around here at least. <coughs> about this worldwide flood that had happened. 
And guess what? They thought that the ark was never able to be found. Well, actually, within this last year, an uh, archaeological crew was able to actually locate the ark. And guess where they found it? They found it right where the Bible says it was at, in Mount Ararat, in the Turkey, in the country of Turkey. Turkey actually is a Muslim-controlled country, so they really didn't allow a lot of people to come in. But now they actually were allowed to come in, and they did a study, and they found out the actual remnants of the ark, and they found a structure that was has a petrified gopher wood, which is what the Bible says the ark was made of. So I'll read for you a little story about this. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth was filled with violence because of them, and behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. See, at that time, there were so many bad people, men and women both, they were all bad. And God was like, I have no other choice but to destroy the whole earth. But he knew that Noah and his wife and his kids, they would help him, and they helped build the ark, and God told them how to do it. So it this is what happens. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover inside and out with pitch. That's like tar, you know, go seal it up. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, and its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it, and you shall make it with lower and second and third decks. Behold, I am even bringing the flood upon the earth and to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life from under heaven, everything that is on earth shall perish. That means everything's going to die. Everything. Right. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark and you and your sons and your wives and your sons' wives your wife and your son's wives with you. And every living thing over all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark and keep them alive with you. And you shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of every animal after their kind and every creeping thing on the ground that is kind and two of every kind will come into you to keep them alive. For as, as for you, take for yourself some of all the of all blood which is edible and gap food which is edible and gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and for them thus Noah did according to God and God commanded him so he did it and then he got it all done he spent years building the ark right and he constructed his family they made it and at times it was difficult because people would make fun of him Hey Noah, what are you doing over there? Ah, oh, you think the world's going to be destroyed? And they would laugh at him and make fun of him. He got it done. And then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, and you and all your household alone, and I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take for you every clean animal by seven. So, of the clean animals, how many were there of them? Right? There were seven. Seven clean animals, and then two of every unclean. That's what God told them. And also the birds of the air and the animals of the field, and male and female, and offspring alive on the face of all the earth. And after seven more days, I will send rain and the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I made. And Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. And Noah was, Noah was how old do you guys think he was? To build this massive ark. 700? Okay. Anybody else want to guess how old? Yes. In his 80s? Could you imagine your dad, if he got into his 80s, building the ark by hand? You didn't get any Makatas or Milwaukee or Dewalt tools either. Anybody else want to guess? 40. 40, there you go. Colt, what do you think? All right, there you go. Okay, well, it says right here, now Noah was six, 
hundred years old. And then the floodwaters came upon the earth. You guys know who the oldest man was in the Bible? Who was the oldest man? Nope. Who? Nope, Jesus was not. He got to read the city too. <laughs> so even Noah's got to be. Yeah. Nope. Guy's name was Methuselah. Did you guys say Methuselah? Yeah, and Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. See, when I was your age, they made us do these little quizzing Bible verse things, and we had to push the buttons. Whoever pushed the button first got to answer the question. Whoever answered right got a point. And that was one of the trivia questions I remember. So yeah, Methuselah, 969 years old. And those are actual years. See, before the flood, there's actually evidence there was a sixth atmosphere that had a ring of water. And then underneath the crust, the Genesis talks about how water, it never rained, water came up from the ground. So there's a layer of water under the earth's crust and it created this thing called a hyperbaric chamber, which allows people to live way longer. But then God opened the heavens and he opened the earth and it flooded the whole earth and we had oceans. And that's how lifespans started to decrease after the flood. So God does mysterious things and we don't really always understand it. But people lived to be a really old age back then. But now we don't get to look at them. Like 120 years would be really long now. So, the flood. God caused the flood to happen because people were wicked. But what did he do to show us a symbol that he would never flood the earth again? Some of you guys have seen these this summer. <coughs> yeah, the rainbow. Yeah, the rainbow is a sign of God's covenant that he would never flood the earth again. So you guys don't ever have to be afraid of the whole earth being destroyed. That's God's promise. Okay, so you get to grab a bag, grab your favorite animal if you like, and there's a special message on it that you are special because God says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Just grab one and go back to your seat. Let's hear a reading from God's holy word as recorded in Matthew, the sixth chapter. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from the Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But wherever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you, what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. 
For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've been going through what an authentic church looks like over at the United Community Church, and I thought we would continue this path forward. And so we started with authentic church, and we've looked at a lot of different ways in which we can have some authenticity. And so the, the church in Thessalonica is what we've been going through with First Thessalonians. That's an easy word to mess up and say not right, but I've been, I only messed up once the other day, so. We're in First Thessalonians chapter 4 now as we've been going through week by week. And that's kind of the theme that I've been going over the last four years or three years that I've been at the United Community Church. You just go topographically through the Bible, verse by verse. Every bit of God's word is beneficial. So we just go through it. And uh, here in Thessalonians, we see that Paul is on a journey. He wanted to go and teach to the, the Jewish people. But God said, no, I want you to go to the non-Jews, the, the Gentiles, and go and teach to them. So he went to Philippi, and he's going to Thessalonica. And, and what they found is, is after every city they'd gotten to, they'd been beaten up and bashed in and jailed, and rioting is starting, and it was just really confrontational. And so I would think in my life, if every town I went to, I got thrown in jail or beaten up or riots started, I'd probably say, you know what, let's just go to this next town and let's just not, let's not bring this God thing up. Let's not share about Jesus this time. I just want to eat a peaceful meal and be left alone. But Paul and Caiaphas and, and all of these men, the, the apostles spreading the word, they didn't do that. They kept sharing the word. They kept giving that gospel, that good spell, that good news, the good message out because they believed in it. They knew how effective it was. And they actually saw in Thessalonica an actual change in the people. We talked about this before in other sermons on Thessalonians, but at this time there were a lot of people in, society, in these societies traveling around trying to sell a quick fix, a quick Quick, get it this way, that way, salesman trying to pitch you something, right? And so Paul, Caiaphas, they, they had to compete with these people. And so he's telling them, hey, I know all these other people said that this was going to make a change, but this is actually changing people. There's some authenticity to it. And so much so that, what was Paul? He was a tent maker. And so that's why they say, oh, you have a tent maker ministry. Well, I haul diesel fuel and gasoline, so I got a diesel fuel gasoline ministry. No, it's, it's you work on the side and you, like Paul, you build tents in the evening. Pastor Josh, he does EMT services on the side. So he's got an EMT ministry. But Paul was good at making tents. So he'd make tents on the side and use that to sustain and benefit his ministry. God says we need to work hard, right? Eat good food. Well, we did that yesterday. And then fear the Lord. So we see here in Thessalonians, we're looking at authentic holiness. And Paul's giving us what an authentic church series can look like. So we see this idea of a spiritual transformation in a church, an actual change happening. And there's some also negative connotations behind that in American or, or Western Christendom. A lot of people say, oh, well, I... I prayed and I cried at a church service somewhere and I'm good now. I had a friend in the, I'm in the North Dakota National Guard, Charles Schwartzmeyer. He told me, hey, I read the Bible. I prayed a prayer and I'm good. I don't need any more of that now. I'm covered. And what we're seeing is, is that there needs to be an actual following, right? There needs to be an actual lifelong journey. This isn't just a, a one and done. Hey, I prayed the prayer. I cried. I'm good, because that's, that's not being a Christian, that's American revivalism. And that may be the start of something that could happen, but just because you cried somewhere doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Just because you 
made a, a short once, I read the Bible and I'm done now, that doesn't mean you're a Christian. And so Paul is addressing this. He's, he's talking about how there must be this issue going on and people who say that they love Jesus but don't actually love Jesus. Like we talked about the Pharisees, how they would do things just so that other people would see them doing it so that they could get the praise, that they could reach and be seen as charitable. And they did it for the purpose of being fake. So we see this big idea of, of holiness here in this section. But then there's also this little part of it that's about sexual immorality. And there are many ways that you can show your holiness to God. In this particular way is God talks about how he is dealing with, Paul is dealing with this in Thessalonica. It's an issue that's going on. And that actually providentially, this is an issue that's going on in America today. Sexual immorality is an issue. It's a problem. American culture, you know, they always say, oh, sex sells. Well, that's something that's always happening. And it's something that they dealt with in Thessalonica. And guess what? We're still dealing with it today. So there's four big words we're going to hear today about this. is saint, sanctification, holiness, and holy. And we see... Holy is being set apart. It means that you're not like everyone else. And holiness is, is a following that path of being set apart. It's a continual journey. And then there's being a saint. Saint is, is someone who we see, when we think of saint, we think of, wow, this person is like super special, you know? But the Bible says it's just a sinner who follows God. And sanctification is a process that we as saints go through as we follow Christ. There's a, a southern gospel song that a saint is but a sinner who fell down and got back up again. And so we try to idolize saints, but they're just sinners who fell down and got back up. And so those are the four big words that we see that this holiness is beginning and that we can see it happen in our lives. So sanctification is that process, that progress that we look. And that's a root word in it is based out of Greek. But they're all related words. Holiness, holy, saint, sanctification. They all have the same Greek root word. They all have that same meaning. They're related. And so we see that in Matthew 6, as we read, that the Pharisees weren't real. They weren't actually saints getting back up again. They were just pretending. They were fake. They were fake Christians. They did it for their own benefit, their own selfless gain. We should be looking for these kind of things and, and, and in our life, we should be working to please God. It's on my Facebook page. I wrote on there that it, life is a long war. This isn't just a short firefight battle. This is a, a lifelong war where we're continually fighting. And the day when this war ends is the day when we die. So let's read 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren, request and exhort you in Lord Jesus that you would receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, meaning you're on a journey, that you excel still more, for you know what commandments we gave you and by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God in your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in a sanctification and honor, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God, but that no man transgress and defraud his brother in a matter because the Lord is avenger in all these things, just, all, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God is not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification 
So he who rejects this, not only rejecting man, but God who gives him the Holy Spirit to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good word. We thank you for this good message. We pray that you allow us to unpack this and see the truth in it and how it's your word for us in this day at this time. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. In your name we pray, amen. So Paul states that this is not his standard, but this is actually God's standard. As many have pushed that this is an extreme requirement that Paul has. Paul, Paul's just going off the deep end, okay? He's not really the one who's saying this needs to happen. But actually, God is stating this is what needs to happen. God is stating that there is this need for sexual purity. And God in our culture is probably a lot of different things. It could be materialism is a God in our culture, or money, or food, or sex, or drugs, Whatever it is, there's all these miniature gods that we create. But God calls us that we need to have this issue with sex dealt with here. Now, Paul, when he's talking in Thessalonians before this, he's talking about the love of Christ and broadcasting that love and caring for one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord and how we need to connect. But then he unpacks this essence and this need of holiness and then in the end of chapter 4, we'll see that he gets back to this need for love and unity. And that there doesn't need to be this division. And so really, when you look at it, it's like an onion. There's all these different layers, but it's still an onion. And that's what Paul is saying, is that this isn't a separate issue. This isn't a separate standard. So issues of holiness. And, and how in, in, uh, in verse 3, we'll look at, or sorry, in verse 1 here, finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God. As you actually do walk, it's like an actual journey that we're going through. So the first thing that God is calling us is to keep going more and more should be continuing on in our life. I've had experiences where even my own family members, they looked at me and they're like, oh, Chris, does everything with you have to be about God? Everything? It's like, well, I like international tractors and I like Chevy muscle cars and I like Mopar muscle cars and I like water skiing. There's a lot of other things, but God is the central focus in everything. How is God not a part of everything? God's calling us to do that. And we keep walking. We keep moving forward. It's kind of like hiking a mountain. Have any of you guys ever hiked a mountain? When I was in Italy, we got to visit my brother who was stationed in a naval base called Siganella. And we went to Sicily and we got to climb Mount Etna. Mount Etna is an active volcano on the Sicilian coastline there. So we get to climb up this mountain and and when you get around one corner, you're like, oh, there's the top. So you get walking more, and then it's like, oh, I thought I would have got there by now. And just as you think you get to the peak, there's always just a little bit further more to go because it's like over 10,000 feet high. And it's a long journey, and that's what the Christian faith is. Just when you think you got there, just when you think, oh, I prayed the prayer, oh, I read the Bible, I'm good. No, you're not. You got to keep going. It's a continual journey. It's a mountain peak experience. And it's not something where it's, hey, I'm perfect and I'm going to keep being perfect. No, it's, I'm flawed. I'm, I'm, I'm full of mistakes. I'm full of flaws and God's going to help me through that. There's so many more peaks to reach as we go day by day. So that's why Paul keeps saying, keep going. And this is not a, a sprint. It's a marathon. Although I do like sprints because then you can get done fast. But it's not. It's a marathon. you got to keep going. And I've run a half marathon, and that was a nightmare. I mean, it just seemed to never end. <laughs> life is a long, tough journey. A spiritual life is the long war. So keep going. 
In Colossians 2, we see that Paul talks about how he's wrote the, written this before, and we read that, that Paul taught that so we tend to separate walking with God and receiving him. That's, again, like I said, that's American revivalism. American revivalism is, oh, I, I cried, I prayed a prayer, and I'm done. And this is, this is the beginning of what we need to follow. We need to be careful not to judge, though, either. We can look at people's lives and look at our other people in our society, other people around us and our influence. We can say, oh, whoa, whoa, you prayed a prayer and you cried, but you're not following God here, or you did this, or I saw that, and I'm going to judge you the way you're acting here now. We can easily start getting into the point where we're going to start judging each other and say, hey, you messed up here. You're, you're not following Jesus. That's, we don't want to get into that. That's dangerous territory. We need to avoid that kind of mindset. Right? We need to take the plank out of our own eye before we try to get the splinter out of our brother's eye. Don't be so quick to judge the things that you see going on with somebody else, but care for them, right? We know that it, uh, it isn't important for us to, to look at others, but focus on ourselves. We have our own race to run. We have our own things that are tangling us up. We have our own things that are tripping us up. And what is important is, is, are we pleasing God in what we do? Are we loving our brother, our sister in Christ? And those that aren't Christians, are we showing love for humanity? In Hebrews 11, 6, we see that it's impossible for us to clean our own lives up. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, let's turn over there. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is that. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. Without faith, we can't clean up our lives. We think that, oh, if I do all these things right, if I do this, then God will love me. If I do this, then God will love me. If I do this, and I achieve this standard, I meet, and I, and I go long enough without sinning, then God will love me. No. It's like we're in quicksand, and the more we try, the further you seek down it. Pretty soon it gets to the point where it's just your nose and your mouth sticking out. And if you keep moving around, keep trying to justify yourself, you're going to be without air. God comes to the sand, quicksand pit. Jesus gets down in the quicksand, and he's got a rope to pull us out, and he comes alongside us in our mess, in our sin, in our falling short. And he says, hey, I'm going to walk through you with this journey. I'm going to come alongside you in your mess. We don't have to clean our lives up for God. God comes to us in our mess and walks with us day by day. He comes alongside us and, and he doesn't judge us. He doesn't point out all the things. But if we ask him, hey, where do I need to work on this next? Where do I need to make that next change in my life? He's willing to show us. And that's what Paul is telling here, those that in Thessalonica, I've got these things that I want you to work on. So John Calvin used this third use of the law example that he gives. And it's kind of hard to stand, understand, but if you're doubtful that God's law is good for you, then you're going to doubt God, right? It's kind of like if I tell Titus or Tate or Colt or Cambry or Jack or Jetta, my six kids, hey, you can't have all that candy. What are they going to say to me? Oh, you just don't want us to have all this sugar, right? They're doubtful of my rule saying you can't have all this candy. Or let me give you a better analogy. If I told them, hey, don't go play out on that highway, right? Am I saying this just because I don't want them to have fun? It kind of looks really fun being out on the highway, right? But guess what? There's semis to fly by. There's people on their smartphones. And in my mind, I'm saying, hey, this isn't safe. This isn't good for you to be out on this highway playing. We were in Carrington at a baseball tournament. And guess what? There's a major highway road that runs east and west out of Carrington, right by the baseball diamonds. And there's semis flying by. Well, I look up and all of a sudden, Cambry this other little girl, another little boy and Colt are up on the highway playing. And it's like, oh, 
but I got to run over there and get them off the road and they're crying because they want to be on the highway. I want to play. It's fun up here. No. God's saying, hey, don't do this because this isn't safe for you. And that's what he's saying with sexual immorality. He's saying, hey, this isn't good for you. Now, this is confrontational, but God is saying here, sex is only appropriate in a heterosexual covenant marriage between a man and a woman. And that's God's, now, this isn't me saying this because I was only born in 1983, which a lot of you were around before 1983, right? But God's law states that we need to have marriage and we need to have sex in marriage and it needs to be a covenant between a man and a woman. And that's what God is telling us. That's what God is, is showing us. That it's a, for his love for us. He knows better because he made us. That's his word to us. Just like a father says, don't play in the street. Like a father says, hey, don't eat all that candy. It's because you love your children. And it's the same reason what God is telling us here. Now, there's lots of things that it can be. It's not just Holiness isn't just about sexual immorality. It's also about whatever it may be, gluttony, materialism, right? Self-praise, self-worship, living in whatever sin it may be you're dealing with. But it's what God wants for us. God's asking for us to show us the blind spots in our life. God wants us to say, hey, where am I blind to this sin that I'm dealing with? And if you want to even go further and really go out on edge, you can ask your friends, right? Hey, Josh, where am I falling short? Where am I messing up here? Uh, you see his look? I know he'd be willing to tell me. You have friends that are willing to tell you where you're falling short. And guess what? God is willing to do that too. But God wants us to love him and to love other people. And so our second point is learning self-control. He wants us to learn self-control. That's a, a characteristic of someone that's following Christ. It's like electricity, right? Lightning is great unless it's hitting you. Bob Crayler is a guy I went to Iraq with. He was a, a Korean War vet, a Vietnam War vet. The guy was, I think he was like 63 years old when we went to Iraq together. He got a waiver to go over but Bob Crayler had been struck by lightning four different times. And the man, when a thunderstorm happened, was terrified. He'd be in a basement somewhere. Lightning is a great thing, but unless it's, if you're getting struck by it, it'll kill you. Lightning is dangerous. Electricity is dangerous. We use electricity all the time. It's a great thing, but it has to be confined to its specific purpose. It's like your grandpa asking you to hold on to that spark plug while he turns the engine over. <laughs> you only do that a few times. Electricity isn't a good thing outside of where it belongs. It's like fire, right? Fire is good unless it's consuming the church or your house. Fire can be a great thing, but it has a context in which it needs to be. So we need to learn self-control. We see here, in Thessalonians, it says here in verse 4, each of you know how to possess his own vessel and, to, and in sanctification, that's that process we go through as saints, and honor not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. I don't know if you guys realize this, but pornography is a huge issue in America. It's like one of the leading industries that makes the most money. And if we in any way support pornography, watch it, look at it, engage in it, we are encouraging and exploiting those that are stuck in that sin, in that industry. It's a big issue. It's a big problem. And it's outside of the context in which God wants it. Pornography is sin. That's why we get that base word in the Greek, porneia, or fornication, or sexual immorality, that it's a bad thing. And we need to be working, fighting against that. I've struggled with pornography in my life, as most people do. And it's something you have to work and fight against. That's why my phone has covenant eyes, and all of our phones do. That way we can track that kind of stuff and work against it and help each other and expose it to the light. It's something that's 
taking hold of our society. It's something that's causing people to be falling away from the Lord. So it doesn't really matter what you do in your life as long as you're daily walking, as long as you're taking and trusting in God and you're working towards that. And you're making, actually working to sanctify yourself, making yourself disciplined. It's a daily process, like everything needs to be. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this long journey, this long war, this long walk that we're a part of. We pray that you'd help us to love one another and come alongside each other. We can work to be holy in holiness, that we can be saints working in sanctification and actually living our lives for Christ. And God, it doesn't matter what color of socks we wear or where we live or what we do, but that we're following you, that we're loving one another, that we're caring for one another, not quick to judge but realizing there needs to be a measure of grace. Lord, we thank you for this good word in Thessalonians. Lord, we thank you for us able to be authentic in holiness in following you. And Lord, I pray you allow us to realize that and strive for it. That it isn't just a sprint, but it's a marathon. Lord, we thank you for this good word. In your name we pray, amen. As it is Father's Day this morning, let us have a prayer for all of the fathers that are here. For fathers everywhere who have given us life and love, that we may show them respect and love. God, we just ask that you hear the prayer for our fathers. For fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends support and console them. God, hear the prayer for our fathers that mourn. And for men who may or may not have children of their own, but act like a father to someone in need of advice, support, nurturing, and love. God, we pray for our father figures. And for stepfathers who have assumed the role with love and joy, who have loved the children of another as their own and created a new family. God, we pray for those stepfathers and for adoptive fathers who have heard the call of God to lovingly step forward for those that need their care. We lift up all the adoptive fathers. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to the needs of their children and have not sustained their families. God, have mercy on absent fathers. For fathers who struggle with temptation, or violence, or addiction. For those who do harm and for those whom they have harmed. God, have mercy on fathers that struggle. And for new fathers full of hope. For long-time fathers full of wisdom. For the fathers yet to be and the fathers soon to be. Hear our prayer for the fathers of your church. And for those that have shaped our lives with without claim of family or kinship, for those who have taught us, guided us, shaped us and molded us into servants of Christ our Lord. God, hear our prayer for the fathers of our faith. God, our Father, in your wisdom and love you made all things. Bless these men that they may be strengthened as Christian fathers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. Grant this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I have two announcements that I forgot to make. I was uh, asked to tell you that uh, yesterday every turkey was used. There was not one left, so that was... That was good news. Uh, and then uh, there is a birthday amongst us. Uh, so happy birthday to Donnell, who 
Today is, shall I say it, he's 41 today. Happy birthday, Donnell. I invite you all to stand as uh, receive the blessing and as we sing our closing hymn. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Just so you are aware, Mandy lost her voice, and so she is not going to sing. But you can always tune into Facebook. I'll put her up there now and then. Have a great day. Go in peace and serve the Lord.